Welcome to Harvard Seminary. My name is Susan Schoenberger. I'm the Director of Communications here. And uh, we're so happy to have you. If you are first time visitors, I hope you'll take a look around our beautiful building, uh, take some materials in the lobby about our classes and our programs. We love to bring people together for all kinds of interesting and mostly free programs. So uh, we hope you'll come back. And uh, really, I'm just going to get started right away, and I'm going to introduce someone who will introduce the people at our panel. <laughs> so uh, I would like to bring up Catherine Poyser. Thank you.
His views on religious history have been sought out by many media outlets, such as the History Channel and the Wall Street Journal, and he has published 12 journal articles, three book chapters, and four books, two of them edited. His best known publications are Muscular Christianity, Man and Sports in Protestant America, 1880 to 1920, Harvard University Press, 2001, and Missionary in Hawaii, The Lives of Peter and Fanny Kulin, 1797 to 1883, University of Massachusetts Press, 2010. Currently, he is writing a centennial history of that family. Next is Ms. Alvani. Alvani Kalito is a Emmy candidate in the Hawaiian Language and Literature Program at the College of Hawaiian Language, University of Hawaii, Hilo, where she also lectured. She holds a BA in Hawaiian Studies from UH Hilo and another BA in English from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Alvani is a researcher whose focus is on utilization of Hawaiian language archival material. Her recent research contributions include these publications, Ma'i Lepera, Disease and Displacement in 19th Century Hawaii by Carrie A. Inglis, and Lincoln, Lincoln and the Candles, New York Times by Jeffrey Ellen Smith. Oleni is currently teaching history at Kekula Olawa Iyo Kalani Baupu'u, a Hawaiian Language Immersion Laboratory School under the College of Hawaiian Language at UH Hilo. Ilani is from Manoa, Oahu, and currently lives in Hilo, Hawaii. And last but not least on this is Dr. David Kiyomasai. Dr. Kiyomasai received his PhD in clinical science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His doctoral research focused on Hawaii's legal and political history since the 18th century to the present. He is the author of law journal articles that focus on illegal occupation. Dr. Sai currently lectures at the University of Hawaii's Windward Community College and does consulting work with attorneys and private companies. So please join me in welcoming our guest. Unquote. 
So how did this success come about? Was it beginner's luck? Maybe it was due to a strategy of converting the aristocracy and the commoners would follow along. Could it have been due to discontent among the Hawaiians themselves and their consequent willingness to try something new, to strike out on a new path in some sort of 19th century version of audacious hope? Or maybe it could have been because the early Christian doctrine of preparatio evangelica was essentially correct, that God has already sown non-Christian cultures with ideas and themes that would grow to fruition once they were interpreted in a fully Christian context. Was God preparing Hawaiians for conversion? I'm sure that the first Protestant missionaries prayed that this was so. Almost four generations were to elapse after the Connecticut Congregationalists arrived in Hawaii, bringing us to the dawn of the 20th century, which Protestants were calling the Christian century. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the magazine by that same name. Because during those 100 years from 1900 to 2000, the whole world was to be one for Christ and his kingdom. This Christianizing vision led to the convening of the Edinburgh Missionary Conference of 1910. But by then, of course, the Hawaiian mission of converting the population to Christianity had largely run its course, though missions in Hawaii and other guises continued. Congregationalists had been joined by Methodists, Episcopalians, Mormons, Roman Catholics, and others. Indeed, today, the Congregationalists in Hawaii are now outnumbered 10 to 1 by Roman Catholics and by more than 3 to 1 by Mormons. But what about the nature of the Connecticut mission itself? We could superficially assert that when the first Connecticut Congregationalist missionaries went to Hawaii, they did so in order to convert people. But what did they actually mean by that? Conversion, it would seem, generally involves turning your back on one pattern of thought forms and practices in favor of another set of sets. Of course, conversion isn't always an all or nothing, 100% proposition of completely rejecting the old and familiar for something new and improved, as Madison Avenue would put it. There's also the realization that adopting a set of religious beliefs may often lead to uncritical acceptance of other beliefs and practices that may appear at first blush to have little to do with the new religious faith being embraced. The fact that missionaries realize this attests to their nuanced view of anthropology and sociology. Many like to think that Christian missionaries unwittingly served as the Trojan horse through which all manner of cultural pollution entered otherwise pristine cultures. A more sinister version of this construct is that the missionaries knew very well what they were doing, realized the gut-wrenching changes that they were bringing to ancient societies, but proceeded to do so anyway, because they thought the task of winning souls for Christ was more important than the potential destruction being wreaked upon an entire way of life. Today, we might call this type of destruction collateral damage. But the mind of the Christian missionary, by and large, was not quite as simplistic as those two views suggest. Clearly many of them, as congregationalists who fled a British society which they found beyond redemption in the 17th century, thus causing them to separate from their motherland, fully realized that grafting a new religion on an ancient social order, whose assumptions and moorings were not always compatible with Christian faith, would be bound to fail unless they transform an entire society. After all, Christ himself counseled against putting new wine in old wineskins, as reported by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Sometimes my Christian fundamentalist brethren, with their emphasis on the individual's personal relationship to Christ, that's the new wine, are not always fully appreciative of the wider social implications, the wine skin, if you will. Missionary literature, however, was fully cognizant 
of what the French would call la mission civilisatrice, and its British counterpart so ably, some would say infamously, enunciated by Roger Kipling in his poem, The White Man's Burden. For example, there's Isaac Taylor Edlund's work of just over 100 years ago, produced in the immediate afterglow of the Edinburgh Missionary Conference, entitled Some Byproducts of Missions. His 1912 book includes these chapter headings, and notice which one comes first. Byproducts in government, in trade, in science, in civilization, in intellectual development, in moral and religious education, in music, in art, world peace, individual development, exploration, in language and literature. Some of these byproducts, by the way, are not found only among those who are being converted, but are found in the missionaries themselves. The civilizing mission, if we will join the French in calling it that, was not a one-way street. If you negatively, we might call this blowback. Among many mission agencies, this would lead to a wholesale revision of what it meant to be a missionary but what it meant to share the gospel, the good news. My more evangelical brethren would characterize this as a loss of nerve, where an appreciation for the target people and culture would lead to soft peddling, the injunction to preach in season and out of season with a relentless urgency. But this is what happened, for example, to the Presbyterian missions of the 19th and 20th centuries in Egypt, it was as if they anticipated a cue from Gene Roddenberry, whose prime directive in Star Trek was that a more advanced alien force had to do everything it could to prevent polluting any lesser evolved societies it might encounter. It didn't want to be too disruptive to a people's natural development. Captain Jean-Luc Picard wasn't into converting nations. He was into making friends though why these two might be thought to be exclusive is another question beyond our examination this evening. In any case, the Hawaiian mission had been accomplished. Its goals were all achieved before such second thoughts took sway in our no-nonsense, hard-headed Yankee congregationalists. They had no fear of disrupting Hawaiian society. Hedlund's catalog of byproducts was, was probably not articulated fully in the minds of the Connecticut missionaries who landed in the Hawaiian Islands about 200 years ago. The American Board for Foreign Missions, an agency of the Congregational Churches, would need time to reflect on how sharing the good news is practiced most efficiently and effectively. In the meantime, the Congregationalists in Hawaii did what they did best. They behaved like New Englanders with all the cultural baggage that might entail. The desire to become more effective witnesses for Christ was part of what led to Edinburgh in 1910. The impulse, however, to see in the person of Christ a figure who transcends worldly boundaries of culture, language, class, and ideology was something that the missionaries of 200 years ago doubtless understood despite all their Yankee pig-headedness, because this had been an aspect of the mission for centuries before. After all, Jesus himself was not self-consciously Christian. He did not speak in the thought patterns of the Greek East or the Roman West. Those among us who are products of an Indo-European cultural heritage and language often have difficulty understanding and then interpreting for others what a first century Palestinian Jew can mean for the rest of the world. This, after all, was the program of such 20th century writers as Mitri Rahbani, whose popular interpretation, entitled The Syrian Christ, endeavored to make sense of Jesus for his Unitarian congregation that he pastored outside Boston between the two world wars in the 20th century. We don't think of Unitarians as being missionaries, but that clearly is 
Moving to the 21st century, we find that Jesus is not so much a focus of Unitarians any longer, or indeed of Western society at large. As stated in Robert Woodbury's 2012 study entitled The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy, and I quote, social scientists tend to ignore religion in the processes of post-enlightenment modernization. In individual cases and events, the role of religious actors is clear. Yet in broad histories and in comparative analyses, religious groups are pushed to the periphery to let the important historical changes be directed by secular actors and forces. Woodbury then goes on to say, yet integrating religious actors and motivations into narratives about the rise and spread of both Western modernity and democracy helps solve perennial problems that plague current research. In other words, if we're looking at history, we ignore religion at our peril. The religious actors that Woodbury wants to have us talk about are the CPs, the conversionary Protestants, precisely the kind of people that left this state to sail to Hawaii in the early 19th century. These conversionary Protestants were marked by three characteristics. They wanted to convince you that they were right. They wanted you to see that for yourself by teaching you to read the Bible in your own language. And they believed that salvation was an individual choice, not the product of group think. And so these conversionary Protestants made the illiterate educated, introduced the notion of egalitarianism, even if they didn't live it themselves, by persuading entire societies that at base all humans are equal in the sight of God. And they commanded the notion that business as usual, which means all too often injustice, corruption, and oppression, was not inevitable and that God stood on the side of those who stood against those real evils. Of course, not all conversionary Protestant missions succeeded. The Presbyterian mission in Egypt, which I mentioned a few moments ago, was not all that successful if we're talking about an actual body count of Egyptians, both Muslim and Coptic Christian, who were converted to Presbyterianism. For Woodbury, these less than successful conversionary Protestants did not serve as a crucial catalyst, initiating the development and the spread of religious liberty and mass education and mass printing and newspapers and voluntary organizations and colonial reforms, thereby creating the conditions that made stable democracy more likely. But that's not Woodbury's point. He only looks to where conversionary Protestants were successful from a religious point of view. And he argues that where those Protestants succeeded, liberal democracy was much more likely to take root. I'm not here this evening to defend or to rebut Woodbury. What I am noting, however, is that 200 years after the founding of the mission school in Cornwall, Connecticut, where Hawaiian-born Henry Okukaya was educated, we are still wrestling with the implications of whether missions are good agents or bad agents. We still wonder whether missionaries are responsible for the collateral damage to a greater or to a lesser extent, and whether or not the blowback from earlier missionary efforts led to a demise in a sense of mission among what used to be called the American religious mainstream. In a sense, it's not just the people of Hawaii who are living with the legacy of the enthusiasm of our Connecticut forebears, an enthusiasm which calls congregations to risk life and limb, or as many Christians themselves would say, it caused them to give their lives for Christ. We too, here in Connecticut, are part of that heritage, that legacy, which drove so many to live their lives in a way that foreshadowed more modern strategies of globalization. Because missionary and missions can be viewed in that way. Winning the world for Christ during the Christian century can 
certainly be seen as an early attempt at globalization. Though the goal of one religion, one religion covering one world was not met. But that overall failure does not detract from those individual triumphs and personal victories of lives transformed in the light of what the Apostle calls all that is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, virtuous, and praiseworthy. Decides to become a missionary, 
And uh, at the time, the American board insisted that anyone who went up to the board, or anywhere else for that matter, had to be married. Um, you know, they, they felt that um, they were not going to have the history protected by uh, indigenous women in other countries. Uh, so that was a requirement. And so Peter went to Boston and said, I need to get married right away. And the ABC then kept, kept a list of eligible women who were going to be to send And uh, they said, well, what about uh, this one here? And um, he said, well, you know, I met her. And, you know, I was selling Bibles when I was in New York. I met her. Sure, so he was shy on And um, like a lot of uh, couples, you know, they were married um, and then were shipped out weeks later, you know, without a date. Uh, so their first, I think, intercourse I was on the boat in Hawaii. They have a son, which I don't know about him yet. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's, you have to really understand the context to, you know, from which these missionaries spread. It was a very exciting you know, time. Um, you also have to realize, I think there's this, um, there are a lot of misconceptions about missionaries. And I think one misconception is that missionaries were uneducated zealots, you know, they, they were not very broad minded. The ABC of them, you know, the Congregational Foundation put a great deal of emphasis on the learned ministry. Um, the missionaries whom they sent to Hawaii were among the most educated people in the U.S. at the time, in the early 19th century. Um, Peter had gone to Princeton, then had gone to Westfield Academy in Westfield, Massachusetts, which was a high school, it was one of the very first co-educational high schools in the country. Um, so these people were not ignorant. I mean, they, they were as, as educated as you could be at the time of the early 19th century in the US. Um, and it's also true that at that point, um, religion and science could coexist. You could be very religious, and you could also be extremely um, knowledgeable about current scientific discoveries, I'd say, which are going to time. So, um, anyway, I embarked upon this project. Uh, my own, my dissertation advisor, uh, when I told him I was going to write a book about missionaries, he said, you are insane. So that's the least fashionable academic topic <laughs> possible to have. Uh, and, you know, I got totally wrong, but uh, <laughs> uh, I do think, you know, I have noticed that you know, I started this project so many years ago. You know, the first times I addressed Back in the conferences, no one came to this panel. And so it's been a great advance to see people to see people take it. Um, so I know that our um, LA is going to talk about, I think, um, missionaries from the wide perspective. I will talk about missionaries from their own perspective. Um, but also, I think I'll be fresh with some misconceptions about the missionaries. I already, I already mentioned that they, they were educated on the wide missionaries. Um, I think there's a conception that they were rapacious, that they were out there, you know, sort of the missionary work was a cloak, you know, that they were using that as a sort of a way to get into Hawaii where they could get money. Um, no, I mean, these people, they're putting their lives on the line, they, um, you know, they, they were very, very uh, part of people. Uh, it is true that uh, many of the missionaries wind up becoming quite well in the world. But um, one of the reasons was that the American board um, sort of left them there and, um, and initially provided them supplies and things. And then in 1837, there was a big financial panic in the United States. And the American board uh, told the missionaries in Hawaii, uh, you should really provide as much as you can for yourselves. So the missionaries you know, went for farming, and they, they, you know, they, they uh, started uh, looking after their own needs. Uh, and then later on in the 1850s, um, the exact date, but uh, the Americans were to be free, um, decided to cut all the missionaries and wipe loose. Um, you can have the mission property that you occupy. Um, you know, you know, you're on your own. And so the missionaries, um, if they hadn't already got the farming and other um, economic pursuits, that was the point at which they did. And then the white government uh, you know, stated that in, in, uh, in honor of their, their work, they would get a uh, special discount on land. Uh, so that enabled missionaries to buy more land than, than other uh, foreign in Hawaii. Um, so this was the beginning of, of their great enrichment. Although it's really the missionary kids who became fantastic 
what we got done about the first one here. So, um, so I think I'm running a little bit of time. Um, I guess I, talking about pros and cons of your chamber. Um, I think that Dr. Blackman had it right. The missionaries, the original missionaries, uh, the, the missionaries from the early 19th century, the Hewlett's, uh, they were not respecters of worldwide culture. I mean, you really can't pretend that they were. Um, they felt that the one culture was heathenish. Uh, they were great believers in their own culture, uh, New England, in the case of the Hewlett's from New Jersey. Um, they felt that the white culture would give way to their culture. Um, and they, they, you know, they pushed that. You know, I think religion was the number one, but culture was very much intermingled with religion. Um, you know, they really didn't think you could be fully Christian if you were not wearing clothes. You're not really separatists. I mean, you know, being Christian was all part of the package. You had to do a knife for wear clothes. I mean, it was, you, know, you couldn't distinguish the religion from the, the culture. And that was the first. I think the, the missionary kids, you know, the Felix children, some of them, um, uh, were much more sensitive and actually, um, um, you know, know collected the Hawaiian artifacts and preserved the Hawaiian language and, and some stories. But the, the original missionaries, like Peter and Henry, they, 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 um, um, they got the Hawaiian really thoroughly. And, uh, um, so, I mean, I think, I, I do think that they sort of in spite of themselves, managed to preserve things um, because it was very fashionable in the U.S. in the early 20th century, probably the early 19th century, um, for there to be missionary museums. And so Peter and Fanny sent back a whole bunch of artifacts to the U.S. Um, the purpose of these missionary museums was not so that people could come in and admire the Hawaiian culture, but so people could come in and be horrified <laughs> by Hawaiian culture and then fund missionary work so that uh, we could extirpate, extirpate this terrible evil Hawaiian culture. Um, but, you know, but the end result was that you did save a lot of artifacts that otherwise would have been lost. Um, I'll conclude. I, I can't say, I, I, I think that, um, I, again, I think you have to, to be fair to the early church, you have to look at things from the point of view, evaluate them in the context of the times. Um, and I also have to kind of say, it's interesting to me because I've encountered a lot of people who are very anti missionary. Uh, but my evaluation is that a lot of people today who would, who are passionate about veganism, or passionate about saving the environment, global climate change, um, if, if you were to transplant those people back in time to the early 19th century, they would likely be missionary. They have the same temperament as these other missionaries. You know, the world has to be saved, it's got to be done now, you know, there's no black and white. It's, and so these, you know, that's what this mindset was. Um, and um, it's also, I think also to sort of make them more accountable to missionaries, <clears throat> you have to realize that they're also, you know, in addition to spreading Christianity, they're also spreading the ideals of enlightenment. Uh, you know, they're passionate about women's rights, if you look some other missionaries before. Um, they're passionate about anti-slavery, they're abolitionists, and they look upon you know, when, when the whites start to report to uh, white, white sugar planters and, and uh, when, when they start to report Asian workers for sugar plantations in the mid 19th century. Uh, the Gulags and other missionary families uh, say, you know, you're treating them like slaves. You're treating them, you're depriving them of their rights, they need a right. Um, so I guess I'll conclude simply by saying that uh, you know, missionaries, their legacy is a mixed one, and you have to think, uh, to be fair, you, you have to. Depending on who you talk to. 
Um, I'm a teacher at a university, and I'm a teacher of ninth graders, and I'm a teacher of 11th graders. Um, so it's different for each, each area of my life, including my, my own peer group, my parents, my kupuna, or my, you know, my grandparents, all kinds of reasons. Um, everyone has their own take on everything that these gentlemen cover. Um, it's hard to, you know, when he says, um, you have to be fair to the missionaries, there's a part of me that goes, I don't want to be fair to the missionaries. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know? But there is a, also a part of me that says that, that acknowledges a contribution. And I think that it comes from exactly what um, he was covering in terms of the kind of person it takes to follow something that you believe in and travel a very long way to do it. That is not different than the Baha'i. And um, I think that in general, my ninth graders, for example, that I teach world history to, would reject anything that's in missionary in it, which is not smart. It's just simply not smart. They're making a decision to remain uninformed. Which brings me to what I want to offer today, and that is how, you know, I deal with a lot of um, missionary generated archives material. And um, because I'm fluent in Hawaiian language, it, and the way Hawaiian history in general is moving forward today, and as we build capacity in Hawaiian language fluency, it becomes less and less acceptable to approach a project without using Hawaiian language resources. Or, um, and many of these documents, Hawaii, the Hawaiian language was the national language of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, it certainly was um, learned by every missionary that landed there, including any other foreigner that was involved in the kingdom. Um, so many of the things that are in these missionary collections are in Hawaiian. So there, Often, researchers, teachers, um, book writers will seek out somebody to do this for them, to take certain um, tasks on to complete their project, which is what I've been doing actually quite a bit in the last few years. Um, I will say this, that it is not easy to read the things these people wrote. Because I interact with my history very differently. Because these are people that I descend from. You know, these are my, these are I'm genealogically connected to them. So it's sort of like somebody saying something really crappy about one of your family members. Even if you agree with it a little more, it doesn't work. I mean, it just doesn't work. We have this duty to kind of step in and say, this is not a good narrative. So I find myself often sitting in there, I have to go walk. You know, how am I going to do this? He's right, but I hate that. You know, you, and then I have a um, peer group that of you know a population of white people that I have to make sure I represent well as um, as well. So this is I want to offer some sort of this is the way that I've been I kind of deal with some of the things that I come across. Um, there is a 19th century scholar named David Mall. He was born in 1793. He grew up during the time of Kamehameha I. Um, later, went on to Lahaina Luna, was educated there um, you know, by missionaries. And um, he wrote a lot of our history down. And in one of his manuscripts that he, um, he wrote, he provides us with a epistemology of Hawaiian spatial relationship theory of life. Um, so I want to kind of explain that to you. Um, I teach this in my Hawaiian studies class, but it's grown to become something that I use as a methodology in my research. And the way I interact with some of these challenging documents. Um, the best way to, to, to understand it is to understand where your body is in relationship to everything else around you. So your environment. Way Hawaiians perceive their place in their environment. For example, this is our po'o, our head, 
there's a space right above your head. It's not, it's right here. It has a name. Every layer of space after that has a name. If we were to look into the sky and look at the layer of space above us that the birds fly, that has a name. Then we look further up, there's clouds, that has a name. We look further up, there's celestial beings, there, there's a name for that. You look as far as your eye can see, and we have a name for that. And then you can close your eyes and imagine what's past that, and we have a name for that. So, what this does is it defines the way we interact. So what we can see physically, we interact in one way, and what we can't see physically, we interact with another way. Now another example of this is to take the front of your body, well, the, the soles of your feet. There is a space below the soles of your feet. So when you're firmly planted on the ground, there's a space beneath you. We have a name for that. And several layers all the way to the core of the earth. You look at the front of our bodies and behind our bodies. Imagine yourself standing at a beach in Hawaii or the shore of any any um, um, land and look out into an unobstructed surface of the ocean for as far as you can see. As you take one step on the beach and your foot gets wet, you have a name for that place. And every layer of ocean after that, the part of the ocean that the whales swim in has a particular name. Every layer of water, until you can, if you look as far as you can see, there's a point where the sky meets the surface of the water. And that's the part, what we call the horizon. We call it Kahiki That's our name for that place. And that sort of gives us a natural barrier to what is ours and what is coming from the outside. So kahiki is a term that is used to describe foreign things. Now, we are ocean people. We migrate. We populated the, the Pacific by moving across oceans. So we're familiar with kahiki Hawaii. We don't necessarily interact with the place behind kahiki Moi the same way that we interact with it from our space from shore. So to the point where our eye can see, that's one space. It's a different space to go past that. So there's an awareness that there's things past that. But we have a different perspective with that and the, the space that we define on our own. Now how does that, how does it even come close to um, being relevant to Hawaiian language or archival resources? Um, especially when they um, have played instrumental parts in establishing discourse for the history of Hawaii. Um, now if you look at, there's really, it, what it really does is it puts, it puts discourse into, history discourse into two different categories. It's the discourse that comes from the space outside the you want, and the discourse that comes from inside of it. Now this does not afford you perspective. That's a little bit more complicated. But it does tell me that what the contribution is either from the outside of that or it's from the inside of it. So it, what it does is it creates um, a seat at the table, so to speak, for me to interact with the things that come from the outside in a valuable way. Because I have a name for that. So it allows me to, I don't have to push it away. I don't have to cut it off. I can interact with it in a way that is valuable for what I need to do. Um, that's in sort of what I encourage my students to do. Because when I think about the um, types of archival resources that I have been dealing with recently, one is um, it is a um, missionary journal from the Lahaina Church, and that's in Maui. And it's one of the first congregational churches that are established in um, the reverend that is keeping a journal, like a daily journal, of the, you know, this many marriages, excommunicated that person for this. And every bit of dirt on every family ever is in this mission journal. But, you know, and you read it, and um, it was, that was where the seat of government was at the time. So there's a lot of our really high ranking elite or chiefs are there in this. 
and you see terrible things about them. And it's just it's really difficult to read. But at the end of the day, there's tons of genealogy information in there. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. So I think that my main message here is that I don't, I don't want to um, pretend that that what we, I don't want to say that we can't find value in the things that have proved that we don't have a good relationship with based on history. But at the same time, there are large parts of our community that are not ready for this conversation. And so what that does is it, it puts an additional burden on, on Hawaiians being very cognizant about the kind of discourse that comes out from here on out. And I can tell you that just being a teacher in a 9th and 11th grade and introductory level university classes, that sometimes it only takes one semester to help a student see something different. And so I, um, I'm kind of burdened with that in a way, you know, about um, what, what do we do with all this information and where do we go. Now I think it's important also to recognize that I don't blame Personally, I do not blame any of the damaging discourse that we have in the history of Hawaii on the, the early arrival of missionaries. But rather, I blame it on a period of time that's 1900 and on, pretty much, where there were different reasons to construct these kinds of narratives, you know, based on our political situation and also their descendants. And we're still recovering from that because we've been educated, myself and I'm sure Keanu, have been educated in a system that has um, used these sort of resources to teach us about our own history. And I believed it. I didn't, I didn't question this. This is what I believe. And then you read a book or you dig into an archive file, and it's like nothing like what you've been taught your entire life. But I will say that the future is bright because um, there are, like we're building capacity. And I think that the narratives are changing, even though they're difficult to change, it takes time. But I, I feel that we will continue to find Hawaiian scholarship will increase and that these collections of materials are no longer absent of the Hawaiian scholar. So we're gonna begin to interact with them in very different ways. And even the things on the table in the back. It's interesting because I'm sure all of us will go and look at those materials on the back of the table and pull something completely different out of it. You know? So um, we're building capacity as the narratives are changing. And I'm pretty positive about that. Thank you. Thank you.
increase of arrogance. You know, he went, like, I don't know. I think he would. Well, I also have a background of being a retired captain of an army, so I began to look at Harold Bigelman as a drill sergeant. Okay, I can understand that. <laughs> I don't get personal over it. That's just the way he is. Yeah. And he had a mission, he had a belief, and he had an objective. And I think, Dr. Blackburn, you uh, provided that. And I think that I'm not one to blame, but I'm one to understand. I need to understand the context of relationships and the, uh, the, the missionaries' understanding of space and time was very different than the Hawaiian understanding of space and time. And then what you have is either a collision or an interaction. An example of a collision was Captain Cook. An example of interaction is the land of the missionaries. Okay. Um, the context of the missionaries, what a lot of people may not know is that Hawaii, the islands, uh, Hawaii Island was actually a separate kingdom from the kingdom of Maui and the kingdom of Kauai. Okay, these were separate kingdoms. In fact, the kingdom of Hawaii, Hawaii Island, referred to the kingdom of Maui and the kingdom of Kauai as the leeward kingdom. Uh, and that's how it's referred to by the chiefs. And they constantly warred against each other. You know, they were constantly warring. It was part of culture. It was part of the season. It was part of Kaili, Kukaili Moku, and so forth. But that is the space and time of Hawaii, Maui, and Kauai. Now, when Captain Cook was killed by the Kingdom of Hawaii, the chiefs of the Kingdom of Hawaii, on a misunderstanding of what Captain Cook needed to do in his mind to get his scooter back, which was to try to get Colonial Hu'u, the king of Hawaii, and take him as a hostage for leverage to get the schooner back. Well, you don't get close to a king and try to grab him. And that's what prompted the collision. Uh, what was very interesting is the death of Captain Cook was not looked upon as a victory by the chiefs, but rather they were sad that it took that shape. Okay? Because you might say Captain Cook arrived in Hawaii during the wrong season. That was the war season. That was his second arrival. His first arrival was doing the Makaiki season, <laughs> wrong season. And he began to act in a way that was not conducive to that season, which is what led to his demise. But you still had that affinity to Captain Cook and to the British. Kamehameha was a young chief at that time. And Kamehameha, as a young chief, was also introduced to the idea and the concept of reading and writing. There was a story that Kamehameha was on a ship watching the captain of the ship, one of these British schooners, write something down and pass it on on a piece of paper. The person at the fore of the ship looks at it and does what he needs to do with the sail. And Kamehameha was astounded by what he saw. Nobody spoke, but actions were taken. And that started to plant the seed in the minds of these chiefs that there is something here that has what is called mana, power. Yeah. Now, when Captain Cook was replaced by Captain Vancouver to continue mapping the Pacific and trying to find the Pacific Northwest Passage, Captain Cook, I mean Captain Vancouver, befriended Kamehameha and they became very close, very close. As opposed to Captain Cook and Kaikili or Kahil of, of Kauai. These were the other two chiefs of the Leeward Kingdoms. Now, it took some time, but by 1794, Captain Cook, I mean, uh, Captain Vancouver and Kamehameha and his chiefs, on the discovery of the ship, Kamehameha agreed to cede the Kingdom of Hawaii to Great Britain. Now, ceding the country is not giving your country away. What actually took place was Kamehameha was joining the British Empire. He augmented the British Empire because Kamehameha remained as king, which is what an empire is, comprised of monarchs. And the highest of the monarch of the empire is the emperor, and this in the case was the British, uh, King George III. Kamehameha recognized the strength of the British. And as a military person and a head of government, he knew it was in his best interest to align himself up with the big boys on the block. 
not only to protect himself and his country from foreign influence and invasion, but also, very interesting, from the Libra kingdoms. And what the chiefs expected from that session and that union was for King George III to send ships and reinforcement so that the Hawaiian Island chiefs can take out the Libra kingdoms. You know, so you still have that sense of, of warrior mentality, uh, things that I can completely understand being a military person myself. Now, that agreement to become British, and I say British by nationality, not English by ethnicity, British by nationality, part of the British Empire, brings along with it not only allegiance to the emperor, but also alignment of your form of government. You have to align yourself up. So naturally, Kumemela began to uh, request from the British bunting, flags. Yeah. They were British. Remember after the Battle of Nuku'ana in 1896, he began to transform the Hawaiian government by establishing a prime minister. Now, prime minister is an English invention from the first Hanover king, King George I, who kept running away back to Hanover, leaving the British government in disarray. And one of the ministers had to be the main minister, thus the prime minister, being the secretary of the treasury. We start to see our historians, like Samuel Kamakau, referring to Kalani Moku, who was appointed at that position, being referred to as Billy Pitt. Billy Pitt is after Kalani Moku's contemporary in Great Britain, William Pitt the Younger. And the other foreigners coming to Hawaii knew that Hawaii was British. You have the British flag. Thus today, you can understand why we have a Union Jack in the Hawaiian flag. Okay, that was from 1816. The other thing that needed to be done was not only was Kamehameha transforming government, government reform, he knew he had to transform religion because the religion of Hawaii did not align itself up with the British Empire when you have sacrifices. You know, and that, that doesn't work in Great Britain because they're Christian or Protestant. You know. So Kamehameha actually requested of Vancouver to bring British missionaries. So the, the chiefs of Hawaii, Hawaii Island, the Kingdom of Hawaii, were anticipating the arrival of British missionaries. But because of the space and time and understanding of Hawaiian political culture, Kamehameha was not of the status to change the religion. He would have created chaos if he tried to say the religion is no longer here. It had to be changed from a Hawaiian protocol. And it was his wife, Kiopulani, who was a very high-ranking elite, who was considered a neo Kio. and that's a very high-ranking, uh, high rank. That rank is equal to the religious law. Okay? If it's equal to the religious law, then it is that rank that can allow or change that religion. So once you uh, see it from that perspective, when the king died in 1819, it appears that certain things were set in motion to terminate the religion. And that's where Kahu Manu, okay, she was a replaced to be prime minister. She would carry out the orders. And Keopulani, who would be Holiho, her son, Kamehameha the second, would do a symbolic act of eating together men and women, which was not so under the ancient system. Men and women would not eat together that was part of the couple. Okay, it was a taiko, uh, uh, a taboo placed upon eating. Okay. And you also have to keep in mind that Hawaiian religion was quite oppressive given the standard we understand it today. Yeah. And let's keep in mind that say, I am Kahumanu. Under the ancient religion, I cannot eat pork, I cannot eat certain fish, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. And if I do, I can be executed. Now imagine as foreigners are coming and Hawaiian women are watching foreign, foreign women eating pork. <laughs> Is something going to hit that person? Are they going to drop dead? Mm, nothing happened. You know, so you also add the idea of change because of experience. And once you start to experience something different, that's the beginning of change. So I'm saying it's not just Kahumanu and Kiyopulani, I think it was a combination 
of interactions that Hawaii is now experiencing because what we cannot forget is when Captain Cook mapped the Pacific, he was bringing in and introducing a, a much more revised form of mapping where prior to that, everything was based upon longitude. Now he added latitude. Once you have latitude and longitude, now you can bracket. Now you can specifically find places. All of a sudden, Hawaii is the hub that ships came through. When ships come, you have experience, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we see that in the journals. You know? <clears throat> so when the missionaries arrived, in 1820, after the religion had been, I wouldn't say overthrown. It's a very interesting statement there because Samuel Kamaka does not say the religion was overthrown. When a monarch dies, that is when it's, it's uh, no, no, it's freedom. You can do whatever you want. Women can eat pork, okay? But you gotta wait till the monarch dies. <laughs> you can eat pork. What Kamaka says is through that symbolic act of, 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 of eating together. See, whenever the monarch dies, the new monarch has to, the new monarch has to reinstate the couple. It was really simple how they explained it. It sort of sounds like John Locke, the apologist, trying to explain how did we have a new king when he was the, 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 with heavenly authority. We should not be here because everything was in the body of the king. You have to become an apologist and then say, well, this is why that happened. Well, here's Kamakawa. It wasn't an overthrow. It's just the Uli did not reinstate the couple. I say, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Sounds good to me. And so that shows agency. That does not show subjugation, control. But it was a way of dealing with something. So, so when that couple was finished, or should I say not being student. Here comes the missionaries from America, 1820, one year later. So the missionaries did not deal with the white religion. The natives did it themselves. Now when they showed up, Ligo Hila and Kilpul and Kapuman were going, who are these people? Because they don't see the British flag flying. They were not allowed to step off of that ship, even though you had natives on that ship, like George Rumi which was the son of Kamuoli, of Kauai, the king of Kauai. They weren't happy. They weren't, on, they weren't allowed to land. They stayed on the ship. And they were getting frustrated. Why can't we land? Well, John Young, the advisor to Kamehameha and the chiefs at that time after the death of Kamehameha, John Young, Greek British, went on board and explained the situation. He explains to the missionaries, right religion, wrong nationality, American. And this is on the heels of the War of 1812. Okay, so you can see the tension for the questioning that may arise. Because Hawaii was very much involved with the War of 1812. You had battles taking place between the British and the Americans in the Hawaiian Wars. So, the missionaries were finally allowed to land. And they were given a one-year license. And that one-year license was staying with the chiefs. They weren't allowed to talk to the people. And the chiefs were watching. Because what was foremost on the minds of the chiefs was that they cannot be perceived as questioning their allegiance to Great Britain under the British Empire. And they watched, and they watched, and they watched. And I can imagine Howard Hiram being very frustrated because he's not doing what he was sent here to do. And you can kind of see that in some of his writings. And he kept lashing out at the chiefs. <laughs> so I, what I'm trying to provide is another perspective here. Yeah. Now, that one-year license was extended three more years. Finally, by 1824, Kahuman and the chief said, this is okay. You are not coming here with American influence. And again, the chiefs they didn't understand or may have not have known that the ABCFM fully understood the idea between separation of church and state. That if you're there for religion, you are there for religion. If you want to work for the government, you quit the ABCFM. You know, you're not going to be funded. So they did, I don't know if they knew that or not, but that was the situation. 1824, they were allowed to go out. Now what was foremost for the chiefs in allowing the missionaries to go out was the fact of what they referred to as the Palapala. 
Allah Ta'ala is reading the brain. You will go out and teach the Allah Ta'ala through which religion will be taught. So they understood the tool of the Allah Ta'ala. Again, the writing going back to commandment the first, it's very interesting writing a piece of paper, nobody's talking, and that person is doing something exactly what I said without saying it. <laughs> that continued. So that's that's the political perspective, you know, which is just one vantage point to what was happening here. You know. And then I saw as the missionaries began to preach, the people were taking to it, and Christianity did take a very strong hold, not because of the missionaries, but because of the chiefs in the directing of the missionaries to teach. See, that's different. Because in that feudal like system, when your Ali tells you to do something, you listen to the Ali, not some religious advisor. And when that religious advisor is doing what the elite says, it's not necessarily following the religious advisor, you're following the elite. It was always maintained in that sense. Yeah. One last point I wanted to make. William Richards is a very interesting character here, who was a missionary. He was asked by Commander the Third in the latter part of 1830s, I'll say 1838, 1839, to see if he could secure an instructor from the East Coast on government reform because they needed to move Hawaii's legal system from the autocracy we call the into a constitutional monarchy because we're being threatened by outside influence, gunboat diplomacy. William Richards could not secure an instructor. Commander III said, then I want you to be that instructor. William Richards didn't want him, but you can't say no to the king. He became the religious, the, not just the religious instructor, he became the instructor of political and government reform. And he, in order to teach government reform, made a connection to Brown University, where he took Francis Wayland, Elements of Political Economy, that was published in 1837, and he translated it into the native language. But he made it where it uh, was appropriate with Hawaii. So when you talk about steamships, he used canoes, you know, things that could be related to the chiefs. And it was translated with the chiefs. And that book came to be known as Noke Kalai Aina. And it was used to teach the people on how government reform is going to take place. And what was interesting is you still had the ancient system of the Makaimana, the commoner, giving labor tax to the chiefs. But the law of 1840 required the chiefs, after the, the labor tax is given, to have the people come together, and that chief was required to read, read sections of no kekalaitaina to the people. And that was a quick way of the people being a part of the government reform. It wasn't a top-down, but rather a top-down, bottom-up understanding of what's coming. And I think a lot of that was dealing with the missionaries in the way they were very uh, progressive. You know, human rights, not human rights, but rights oriented. You know? So you see that, what, what I'm trying to point out, you see interaction, not collision. And I think the, under, the misunderstanding comes with missionaries is 1893, the illegal overthrow of the white government, which was done by the missionary party, not the missionaries. And the missionary party, as they called them, were the descendants of these missionaries. So when people start to read Hiram Bingham's statement of that, they might quickly move and take that from 1830 and quickly leap to 50 to 60 years later and say, ah, see, they were part of the overthrow of the government. No, that was a different context, a different space and time. And then you also see the Americans, when they're trying to annex away, you know, that, especially General Schofield, praising the missionaries for civilizing the natives and using that rhetoric that we now understand today, but that was a that was that, that was just rhetoric. That was not the case. Yeah. So I just wanted to provide some added context to this, and you can see how when you look at history, it is very complex, and I don't think you can ever simplify it. It's you're always open for more information, and as a political scientist, I am always I always have to keep my mind open 
to see and understand not only collisions, but also interactions with a few collisions. <laughs> Thank you.
opportunity to learn through the medium of foreign language. It would be a huge disservice to them if I didn't teach this stuff to them. But the reality of the situation is, is that we're still building capacity on the level of teachers. And that until that changes in larger numbers, where we're doing it right is not going to ripple out. And so um, I think that through, you know, Keanu's textbook and trainings and re-educating and professional development, you hope that when you look at the mainstream of the schools, that they're also taking this perspective to things. Um, but it's the fact of the matter is, is it we really need to get more Hawaiians going to college, in teaching, in the classroom, everywhere else. We need them. We need them to do that. We need them fluent in all of them like me. We need, we need to build capacity to see, I think, really long-term effects of this. I would say it's interesting because, you know, I have, I have school-aged children in my family, nieces, my nieces and my nephews, and when I ask them about these things, they almost always know about the overfill. Everyone seems to know about the overfill. That's about it. Everything else is sort of piecemeal. So um, I, I'm lucky because I get to teach it. But I wouldn't say that that is necessarily true for if you pulled 10 average seventh, you know, 10 random seventh graders, what you would get. So I'll get out to you. Okay. Uh, I think sometimes the missionaries are blamed for cultural destruction, for doing things like banning the Mula, but I think a much larger factor was the trade diseases. Uh, Cook estimated the population of the Lion Islands at 400,000 by 1853. There's only 40,000 Hawaiians, and I just can't imagine the impact on the culture that none of that would have. Well, you know, that, that $500,000 number, um, 500,000 $500, number is actually an old number to me. It's believed to be much higher than that. You know, in terms of um, cultural erosion, there are several factors. And um, yeah, the missionaries, it is popular to say that the missionaries are responsible for some of them, and they are. Um, however, if we're not looking at these things in a way that focuses more on the revitalization of these things and the restoration of these things, which requires us to look at these pieces of history accurately, then how do we ever retain what we have and reinvigorate the things that we have created? <coughs> so it's essential for us to take the focus off the missionary. It's sort of like Captain Cook, right? We talk about Captain Cook a lot, and my students are equally obsessed with Captain Cook. Because that's sort of this common ground we all have, you know, it's a sort of point where everybody kind of knows a little bit about Captain Cook. So that's what we talk about. But in reality, it wasn't a, that big of a day in Hawaii. You know, Captain Cook died and life went on. It wasn't a big day. We, you know, we talk about it because that's what everyone wants to talk about. And when you pick up what, when you do pick up textbooks these days, and you know that has been written in some sort of academic journal, and it says once upon a time there was Captain Cook. I don't, I want to throw it in the rubbish now because it's ridiculous. But then, you know, so my point is that I have to take the focus off some of these things because in my world, we're more focused on honest history, move forward. Honest history, move forward. It's much more productive. I was not going to comment or just add on to that. I mean, what you're really saying is, I mean, what you're talking about is saying this is our history is much deeper than contact. Yeah. And that's the whole thing about Captain Cook is like, whenever he's sort of that, like you said, it wasn't a big day in Hawaii, but it was a big day in the rest of, you know, in the so rest of the world yeah. because he was like the Captain Kirk. <laughs> he was there for months, right? Yeah. So I mean, it was kind of a huge deal to everybody else but us. And I actually really fascinated when you go to visit Alaska or other places where you see like the cook and lives, you see like sort of like, you know, this guy that everybody loves, but the Hawaiians and everyone wanted to go, what? You know, it's always like, that's not our history. Because right? we did introduce some diseases and, you know, um, 
know, so it wasn't like this, this great trip, but it is interesting the way that you're talking about it because it's like that's something in our history that was just pretty really small yeah. part of our history. But so well, when you look at Captain Cook, the other perspective of the British looking at Captain Cook as a discoverer. Yes. Okay. As far as contact, the people of Hawaii knew. We had more contact before Captain Cook. Yes. And I'll give you an example. There was a chief, a king of Hawaii named Dingo. Okay. We're talking 1400s, 1480s, around there, circle. <laughs> now, there was a, a shipwreck on the island of Hawaii that appears to be Japanese. Okay. And King David Kalako speaks to that because that was part of our history. And there were swords. Metal. Okay. And they merged into the people. So you might say we have some Aboriginal Hawaiians that are part Japanese, you know, since the 1500s. We also have ideas of, uh, of Spanish learning, and there's some examples of Aboriginal Hawaiians having table hair, red hair. You know, so you actually have contact before Captain Cook. But what's interesting is Liloa was the king. And he was the last king to have the knife, the metal knife. Now, there is no metal in Hawaii, but he had the knife. And everybody knew he had the knife. But then after he died, nobody knew where the knife went. It wasn't until the Aikapu, which we speak of the, 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 the termination of ancient religion and the destruction of the Heo, that one of the Kahuna, Okay, one of the priests took certain ka'ai, okay, which are coconut scent uh, caskets uh, that have the bones of the chiefs that were revered and, 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 and worshipped, taken to a cave in Ka'ahoa to be hidden. We'll come in the fort with his father's reluctant consent, went to Ka'ahoa to get those ka'ai, which ultimately ended up in Bishop Museum. And Bishop Museum in the 1900s opened it up to see what was in there other than just the bones. And what they found was funerary objects, which included the knife. And you see it, it's very rusted. Yeah. So Kalakoa did not know where the knife went because you don't open up a ka'ai to go look at it, even though Kalakoa had the two ka'ai with him because it passed on from Kamehameha the fourth to the fifth to Runalilo, Kalakaua, Lilibo, Kalagi, and then Prince Kuhio, who put it into the Bishop Museum. So when you see the, the story of the knife, you can see how accurate it was without Kalakaua knowing about it, that it was right there with him. But it clearly shows how history could continue to be so precise from the 1400s to that point in the 1800s when he wrote that book. You know, so it gives you an idea of not only Hawaii had contact with other foreigners from Kahiki, which we say from the foreign lands, but Captain Cook was just given more press. That's really all it was. So you can see it from the British standpoint and the American standpoint, but if you look at it from the Hawaii standpoint, Captain Cook was just a blip on the history of Hawaii. Right. Yeah. But it's the Western influence of the education from the West It's sort of like Americans think that Pearl Harbor was like when the Americans and Hawaii started. Like most Americans think that's when they were. Yeah. Yeah. Anything before Pearl Harbor? It's like pre history. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, Pamela, I really like your sort of explanation about um, the development of the government, you know, different forms of government and how it was really so much coming from the Hawaiians. And I think if we look at Christianity in Hawaii in the 19th century, I think. The folks in Boston would not have been able to recognize the Christianity the way it was practiced by the Hawaiian people. I mean, I think it was very, it was based in Hawaiian culture and had kind of a veneer of Christianity, but it wasn't at all, you know, lockstep kind of thing. Um, so I'm wondering about what your take might be on. 
1848 land reform, the Great Mobility, because I think really that that point in Hawaiian history is, I mean, to me, that's the beginning of the end, the privatization of property. And, and, and that's a good point, Jenny, that people understand today, but I can tell you that's completely wrong. Yeah, we're going to say, yeah, talk about that. Talk yeah. to us about that. It, the mahele, see, when you translate mahele into the English language, it's called division, not private ownership. In fact, private ownership began during the days of Kamehameha III as early as 1839, when title was beginning to people in fee simple, meaning you can pass it on to your successors, but with certain conditions. Okay. Now, what was happening with the Mahele was actually to protect the lands and secure it amongst the people. Because at that point, Hawaii is experiencing a lot of gunboat diplomacy. Captain Laplace arrives in 1839. Lord Pobet arrives in 1843. Under the law of nations, when you have public lands in the name of the government, you know, that is fair game for, for a Congress. But during that time, you have positive history. This is that Chancellor Kent, who spoke of international law, and he was a great contributor to international law from the United States. Private property cannot be touched. So the driving force of the Mahele was to secure it and protect it. Through the new rules that Hawaii began to engage, because they're not an independent state. So when you look at the type of uh, books that were used to inform the Privy Council, you actually see Blackstone, you actually see international law books, you see Emmerich de Vatel, you know, you see Montesquieu and the separation of powers. It's amazing what was informing these people because they were very literate. They had achieved literacy, both Hawaiian and English, at the upper level. Yeah. So the Mahele was that move. So the way we perceive the Mahele today, it stems from from uh, Dr. Uh, Blackburn's perspective that, that that I completely agree that they blame the missionaries an extension of colonialism and they manipulate it. No, that's not the case. See, what you do is when you do that, then you reduce Hawaii as if they were little children being manipulated by the power. No, that wasn't the case. <laughs> One thing I want to explain, I want to uh, bring up because we're talking religion, I want to I want to kind of move away from the, the Mahele aspect, but we can talk about that much more in detail okay, mm -hmm. later. Um, Hawaii began to experience the consequences of not being tolerant with religion. You know? Now, in Europe, religious toleration came as a result of bloodshed, right? Protestants, Catholics, right? The Treaty of Westphalia, uh, 1648, uh, the end of the Holy Roman Empire, you know, where no longer is the Pope going to issue papal bulls on what country can get what area of the world. You, know. you now have states themselves being created with monarchs or, 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 or later, like the Swiss, a republic or republics and so forth. In Hawaii, you had a situation with Catholics, because I find that this is what I found very interesting. There was a collision of Catholicism, because in the 18, early 1830s, certain Catholic priests basically came into Hawaii and began to convert the natives, the commoners, to Catholicism. And that angered the government, because number one, they did not come in to request a license. They were very deceiving. They went and began to teach. So Kahumanu, as prime minister, rounded up these priests and shipped them off. And that became a very volatile incident that would have repercussions. And then that prompted uh, well, another priest came in from Great Britain, but he was Catholic, and started teaching again. So you have that tension there. And when you go ahead and try to say this is Catholic, where well, you're going against Protestant. And Protestant was determined and declared by the government to attack the, 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 
Protestant religion was to attack the Jews. And they didn't take lightly to them. So an ordinance was passed, an anti-Catholic ordinance, where Makainano, who weren't Catholic, were rounded up and arrested and put in jail. Well, Captain, uh, so, so the American uh, diplomat at the site of Hawaii, I believe it was 1837, he thought that that was the working of the missionaries. So he sent a letter to Clement III asking if the American missionaries were involved in that. Were they encouraging you to pass this ordinance? And what I found very interesting was the letter in response written by Clement III to the U.S. diplomat saying, the missionaries here only assisted us in learning how to read and write through Palo Palo and the religion. They are not the government. We are the government. And we made this decision. And he points to God the money. Now that is very interesting because it's the only government that sets the tone. No, no. Don't think that we are not in control. We are. Now what that did was it got them to think people are getting a bit uh, <coughs> tense, you might say, regarding this anti-Catholic ordinance to the government. Well, it's just the law. We're arresting our people. They're violating the law. What he didn't know at that time was it's going to start to get the French involved, who Captain Laplace in 1839 is in Tahiti and hears of this anti-Catholic legislation. And he took that as an affront to France, who represents Catholicism. And here comes that portion coming in. So you see Clement III and the government dealing with gunboat diplomacy in a way that is quite interesting as always going for government reform. So a lot of the change that is going on is experiential. And not, oh, this is what happened here, that's mimic it or not. And what the government experienced they adjusted and they moved on. And I think that's an interesting play because it kind of presents a very different picture of who the missionaries were and exactly what was their function. I think that um, the Hawaiian word for Protestant is ho'ole ope, which means to deny the hope. See that word popping up right around this time. <laughs> so we're talking about, this is very significant. And this is planted in, in newspapers that are edited and funded by both missions and my government um, funds. So, and that's still today, that's what we call Protestant. You know, I'm so, I'm so glad Paul brought that up because I forgot to state that in that same letter of Commander the Third, he tells the US diplomat, which I found really interesting because I'm Catholic. So am I. Yeah. <laughs> 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 But, I went, but both, I went, both of us went to a Protestant school. <laughs> so I'm reading this, and Clement III also stated that this, this uh, Ramish religion, they call it the Ram, this Ramish religion, we overthrew in 1820. Now they're taking ownership of this and saying, it's like, this is what we used to do, worshiping idols, the saints. You know, because the Protestant is, you get rid of that, you just got the cross, right? And when you see that from a Hawaiian perspective, say, no, no, we got rid of that. That's the reason why this is the ordinance. So you start to see what is behind the enactment. And what you don't see there is manipulation. What you see there is agency. No. Very different, very different. In fact, Kamakawa writes an entire, almost an entire chapter on why Catholicism was more conducive to the ancient religion than the Protestant. And that, I don't know if that's in the because it's in the original um, Hawaiian text, it came in the Hawaiian newspaper. It's incredibly interesting. The Catholic Church was very successful in the short time that they were there. Because they the grew numbers quickly. grew really quickly. Yeah, because it was very, even though we had this big shift in you know, religion at the top, it didn't filter down immediately. So um, the commoner classes are still very much practiced in their own form of religion. And so when the Catholics came in, it was a huge threat. Well, one of the complaints of the Protestant missionaries, the Congregational missionaries, was that the Catholic missionaries 
or you go to the Mexican Peninsula and you cross it over in Mexico. You know, so all these things come into play, and that's what I'm saying is the complexity of of history and their events that we need to keep in mind these type of things. So just so happens that yeah, we were British, but then we weren't. <laughs> And we still have the Union Jack in our flag, which is the symbol of not colonialism, but actually being a part of the British Empire. Which is a colonial body. Oh. Why not the British Empire. Empire. Because you have the, the way you can tell if you were a colony of Great Britain, you don't have a king there, you have a governor general there who took over that place. When you have a king within a kingdom, which is called a British protector, you're part of the British Empire. That's different. And that's why Hawaii was able to control its form of government even though they were still British. You didn't have a British entity that came to Hawaii like in New Zealand where you have a governor general, who now is an extension of the monarchy, which we still have today in the common I have a Jeremy Warhouse question. Sure. I was wondering, I'm going to get a couple of iterations. Um, I'm wondering if anyone knows anything about the Burr family. Um, so at CCSU, we have the Eagle Burr Library. When I first got there, I was like, that sounds like Hawaii. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be common. Eddie from Britain. Um, you are? Yeah. He's from New Britain. Um, but we have a library at CCC called Eddie from Britain Library. And um, they've got this brand of story. That doesn't ring any bells. Was he a missionary or what? I don't know. I, I, looked, I kind of researched a little bit. And um, he seems to be a missionary family. So I don't know if he's like a descendant of a missionary. I don't think the last name is spelled wrong. Is that right? How do you spell it? B U R I T T. B U R R I T T. And then you see it with those Y. Yeah, in Hawaii? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure I see it with a Y. Try to check it with a Y. Check a Y. Okay. Thank you all so very much. This is